Hi guys, I'm Sam from the Unity of Life and welcome back to my channel. So, if you've been watching some of the previous videos, you'll know that we have been looking at breeding in these last couple of videos. So today we're going to have a look at something called the evolution of cooperative breeding, um, which is more to do with wild animals than domesticated animals. Um, and even though it's called breeding as such, it's got very little to do with animals actually reproducing reproducing so what is cooperative breeding well cooperative breeding is just a fancy term for saying that the parents have babysitters they have help looking after their offspring right so it's not necessarily um related to individuals neither sometimes unrelated individuals will help um, these parents raise their offspring as well so this cooperative breeding behavior generally happens in group animals so animals that live in groups um, and most often or not it happens when there is a hierarchy within these groups as well so you only have mom and dad who are breeding so we're going to look at a few few different examples of these different animals that do these. Um, but basically, if mum and dad are the ones who are breeding, if it's a family knit group, then the siblings look after their, help to look after their younger siblings, right? Um, but sometimes non-relative um, animals will also help the dominant pair to look after their offspring as well. So the thing that makes this so interesting is in these groups that these animals live in and they're not necessarily always family groups but if you've got a dominant male and female who are the only ones who are generally allowed to breed and all the subordinates have to repress their um, reproduction why are they helping isn't it not more beneficial for them to leave this group and start a group of their own so that they can have the chance to reproduce well we're going to look into that a little bit because you would think that an animal it wants to be able to pass on its genes and its genetics into the next generation that is the whole point of the survival of the fittest it's the theory of the, the even though you may die your genes are living on so part of you is in a way immortal because there's always going to be part of you in your direct descendants um there is always going to be a part of you and your descendants that are directly related to you as well but the genetic material is going to be much less so it that's why it sort of boggles people's minds why this cooperative breeding has evolved because they're not they're potentially not having these siblings themselves so let's get into a few of these examples so well actually before we get too far into it i'm going to be using the terms of breeders and non-breeders so obviously the non-breeders are the spotted and so the ones helping the breeders e.g mum and dad some of the time or the alpha male or female the dominant pair to look after their offspring they're known as breeders um and the ones that help are non-breeders so our first example is wolves like I said, I love wolves. Quite a lot of my content um, that I'm going to be doing on animals is going to be focused purely on wolves. Um, because whenever I got the chance that you need to pick an animal, any animal, they weren't dictating which animal. I always picked wolves nine times out of ten. Um, unless they weren't available for some reason. So, wolves, which their scientific word is, the, is Canis lupus and a domesticated dog's scientific word is a canis lupus familiatris so familiatris just is posh word of saying domesticated so the wolves so canis lupus is generally a grey wolf but anyway i'm going to just talk about wolves in general because no matter what species these wolves are they generally um have similar quite similar behaviors and live in the same way so those wolves are great examples of cooperative breeding between kin. Kin means that they're related. 
Wolves have a dominant hierarchy. Remember when I said they've got an alpha male, they have an alpha female, that's generally mum and dad. They are the only ones who breed and they're the ones that are in charge of the whole pack. So the pack, the rest of the pack members are made up of these alpha pairs offspring. So you've got mum and dad, and then you've got their first litter, and then you'll have all the other litters after the first one. So it depends on how many litters that they are able to produce in different seasons. So both breeders and non-breeders, so older offspring generally, take care of the young. Non-breeders, which are, like I said, they're the older siblings, are critical to the fitness of the breeders and the pack reproductive success. So when I'm talking about fitness in this um, instance, I'm not on about how long that they can run, that stamina that they have, how physically fit they are. I'm talking about their genetic fitness, okay? So your genetic fitness is going to be really good if you have kids. If you don't have kids, like myself, your genetic fitness is, it, it's not very good. Because your genetic fitness is all about reproducing, passing on your genetic information in, to the next generation. And your genetic fitness is only then improved if your offspring grow and they get to the point where they are adults and they're sexually mature and they go on to have children. So once you've got grandchildren, and then you have great grandchildren, your genetic fitness improves. So, duties the older siblings provide are foraging, protecting the young from kleptoparasism, which is when other food other wolves come along, they steal the food from their young. So they guard the puppies as well and they feed them quite similar to how birds feed their offspring so they regurgitate the food for the pups because the pups are maybe just being weaned from mum so they haven't quite got to the stage where they can eat natural um, solid foods um, because they're in the wild they have regurgitated foods um, unlike puppies that will have like domesticated puppies that will have um, sort of like soft foods and things that have maybe made in our lab specifically for them to help being weaned which we discussed in our last video in managing young so it may be reasoned wolves remain within their natal group so the group in which they were born in giving them a longer to mature and when there are no pups or when resources are plentiful, so there's lots and lots of food around, the parents will continue to feed the yearlings. So a yearling is a, is a wolf that's only one year old. Whilst the pack members stay behind from a hunt to care for the pups. So they're... they're these are the right, so the yearlings they tend to stay behind to help look after the pups uh, while the rest hunt because they haven't quite got that experience um, of the hunting yet. They do learn, don't get me wrong, they do learn and they will get experience, but the more one once they get more experience then they will join the hunts and the litter that they help to raise will then stay behind and look after the next litter. It's like a conveyor belt. So staying with their family could also help wolves gain a territory. Because well, you need a lot of wolves behind you to be able to gain a territory. Because wolves are very territorial creatures. So a territory is anything... Is, is basically the habitat in which they live in that they or no other packs allowed in there. Their territory is like it'll have a few dens in there because they'll have a nursing den and then they'll move from the nursing den to another den um they have quite a few and then they'll also have so much food and resources in this territory as well which is theirs as a pack of no others so if you've got you come from quite a big pack you're gonna have quite a big territory and that's what all wolves want um a lone wolf is really not a happy wolf 
Um, but you do find the wolves that were the more dominant when they reach about two years old, they may choose to leave the pack and go off and find another, um, another like another lone wolf, or they'll try and coax another wolf out of one of their packs and they'll start a pack themselves. So, uh, one study has found that the genetic relatedness, so how related a wolf was to a pup, it influenced the pup's survival. Okay, so researchers found direct fitness benefits helping to explain why certain pack members stay with the pup. A non-breeder's benefit is lesser experienced hunters remaining with the pups provide care and can be easier to obtain food because they're not very good at hunting then they haven't quite got that skill so if they stay and look after the pups they're going to be rewarded and the food's going to be brought to them. There is evidence to suggest the gen Direct fitness benefits may influence over offspring, the older offspring care for their younger siblings. One study inve investigating pup guarding in wolves found bigger packs were more successful because there's more wolves so they can bring down bigger prey, they can have larger territories. More members meant greater availability to guard the puppies. Thus ensuring survivability to adulthood with significant members left to hunt much larger players than smaller packs would be able to predict. So basically all that was saying um, was the reason that they think some wolves stay in the natal group, so their family group, the pack, is purely because if they help raise their siblings, it is the same as helping their child, okay? We share 50% of our DNA with a full sibling, so a sibling that we share both parents with. And that's how much genetic information you pass on to your offspring as well. You only share 50% of your DNA with your offspring. And the further along we get, so grandchildren, nieces, nephews, half-siblings, cousins, aunts and uncles, that 50% is split into two again, which is 25%. And the further down we go, the less genetic material you are sharing. So another group animal that um, is very keen on cooperative breeding is meerkats. Which you will all be aware of if you've ever seen meerkat manor. So again... Meerkats are quite similar to wolves. They live in closely related groups known as mobs, not packs, it's called a mob. Meerkats, like wolves, have a hierarchy, so they've got the dominant male and female, and they're the only ones who are allowed to reproduce, and all their offspring, older offspring have to look after the younger offspring. And the non-breeders who are generally, yeah, right. So unlike female wolves, non-breeding females have been known to lactate for their younger siblings, suggesting that the subordinate females contribute to the feeding of the offspring more than subordinate males. The reasons being that the males don't have the mammary glands, so they can't lactate. Um, and this is a very weird phenomenon because, as you know, a lot of the time, female mammals don't generally lactate unless they are pregnant or nursing. It was found that group size, litter size, the amount of rainfall and maternal conditions did not affect how likely a female was to provide aloe nursing. So aloe nursing is a term that we use when more that a lot of females are able to produce milk and lactate and feed their siblings. So aloe nursing is just a fancy term um, when more than the mum is is feeding the offspring. So you have um, Lots of females, they're lactating. Um, it's not just mum and they are all nursing offspring that's not theirs. So females that were either pregnant or had recently been pregnant were more likely to allocate, 
uh, sorry, allolactate than other females. This allolactation, same as allonursin, um, behaviour was stronger in females. Uh, so stronger if the females were highly related to the litter's mother. So if they were older siblings, older sisters, or an aunt. Suggesting that these females may gain indirect benefits from performing these behaviours. Older females and females are allowed back into the mob after being evicted. So they do get evicted and that's purely because they were pregnant in the first place. Um, were more likely to allolactate. And the reason that they evict them, I know it sounds rather cruel, but just in case you don't know anything about me, cats. It's because the more mouths there is to feed, the more competition there is. Okay, so Granny is not really going to care that much for her grandbabies because she's still in charge, she's still able to reproduce, and her priority is her offspring, not her daughter's. Okay, so if her, if her daughter has pups, they are going to be a threat to her or younger siblings. And the mum, who the one who's in the dominant female, is not going to stand for that. So, so sometimes they are allowed back in, and that's purely because they've lost their their offspring because they can't survive and um, and feed them when they're on the run. So it seems females were more likely to nurse offspring, not theirs, for longer periods. If they were in good condition, they were found to invest more time in if the litter was a larger litter, or if the pup's mother was in poor condition. It is thought that allolactation produces a combination of direct and indirect benefits for non-breeding females. This may advance with maternal skills. Dominant breeding meerkats gain a lot of benefits from allowing subordinates to contribute to the care of their offspring like allo nursing. However, non-breeding meerkats must also gain a lot of benefits from helping to care for the offspring that are not theirs. It has been observed in meerkats that dominant breeders contribute less than adult helpers in their mob when it comes to the care of their offspring. The dominant meerkats were also observed to raise their contributions. Also, to rise, yeah, to raise their contributions to the care of their offspring when there were low numbers of helpers. Interestingly, when a subordinate had a successful forage, they were found to share food with the pups. Whereas the dominant ones are less likely to do this, even though the dominant meerkats are biologically, uh, um, are the biological parents of the pups. It is known that both subordinate males and female meerkats contribute to the care of the dominant pups. However, if any of the subordinates were to breed, then the dominant meerkat would not contribute to the care of the offspring, even if the new offspring were their grandchildren. In the case of the subordinate female meerkat, it is much more beneficial to be part of a small mob. The female is less likely to be evicted if she gets pregnant because um, they need more, um, more bodies, if you will, to be able to, uh, again, gain large territories and to be able to hunt more food, much better food. Whilst being a part of a small group as a dominant female will need her help to look after her young, especially if the subordinate female is lactating, so they are allowed to still care for their young as well. The benefits of the subordinate will be to have the rest of the mob help with raising her offspring, increasing the chances of the subordinate's DNA being passed on to the future generations. However, if the subordinate female were to become pregnant while she is part of a large mob, then she would find herself evicted, decreasing the chances of survival for her own bomb pups. This suggests that it is more beneficial for the subordinates to stay in their natal groups when they are high in numbers of their genetic, yeah, high numbers um, of individuals.
vegetables as the benefits of the protection of the group. Better food resources and helping their genetic fitness by ensuring younger siblings survive outweigh the cost of being pregnant and evicted. It is also believed that regardless of the size of the mob, the dominant female has some control over who is allowed to breed and when. The dominant will only allow a subordinate to breed when it's more beneficial to the dominant uh, female. So we're going to look at the mongoose. So mongoose are quite similar to meerkats. So mongoose is like wolves and meerkats. They live in groups where subordinates help the dominance to raise offspring. Unlike breeding meerkats, breeding mongoose have a high contribution in raising their young. This may be because the branded me <laughs> mongoose has a long reproductive skew, where meerkats have high reproductive skew. Um, so... Mongoose have low, meerkats have high. Um, so that means meerkats breed more and have more offspring than what mongoose do. The reading mo mongoose do not increase their contributions to raising the young when the size of the group increases. It is believed that non breeding mongoose, similar to non breeding meerkats and wolves, benefit from caring for the young that are not their own but are highly related to them. However, very few studies have been able to show that non breeders who stay in the natal group do benefit from helping to raise their youngest generation in their group. The pups benefit hugely from having a lot of time invested into them, as in the case of the branded mongoose. When all members of the group increase their survival rate, this purpose Sorry, this poses the question why a non breed is dedicating so much time to reeling highly related offspring that are not their own. The answer seems to be linked to the fact that the branded mongoose has a very low reproductive scheme, meaning that they do not produce a large litter and very infrequently, so they don't seem to have a breeding season. Non-breeding mongoose may benefit because they have helped to raise offspring that are not theirs. The other group members will be more likely to help them to raise their offspring if the opportunity ever arises. However, if the non-breeders do not get the chance to breed, at least some of their genetic material has made it into the next generation via their relatives. Living and helping others within the group offers protection and greater access to resources such as food. So we're going to look at birds now. So we've looked at quite a few mammals who have gone away from mammals, mammals and we're going to start looking at birds. Um, birds like Edgar. If you remember, he's a little skeleton bird that I have in some of my videos. One of my videos. Um, I believe he was in the engine no he wasn't he was in the brief history of formula one a video so you can check that out to me edgar if you like so some avian species so birds have cooperative breeding systems however unlike the wolf the meerkat and the mongoose birds do not always live in a family group some avian species may stay with their parents for longer periods than others. It is thought that this provides the birds with longer to mature by helping their parents with their younger siblings. The older offspring get the opportunity to learn how to raise their offspring. One potential reason some birds stay in their natal group is to avoid incest. Where territories are in short supply. Because the last thing they want to do is mate with a sibling or a parent. In some species, some male non-breeding helpers are not related to the parents of the offspring. Now, this sounds a very creepy and weird, right? And no, it's not. Um, it's basically because they're sneaky and they're clever. So let, let's find out why they're so sneaky and clever. It is thought that the reason that some birds do this is to prove that they are mate material. Allowing them to breed in the next season. So they will sneak their way in and they'll help you, this, this couple look after their offspring, raise them up to survive. And then next breeding season, she's looking for a mate. 
they know their milk material because they can provide for the young. Sneaky, sneaky, sneaky. Several studies over the decades have been conducted to investigate kin structure in every avian species. They found that although many avian species do not live in a kin-based group, some do. The bird species that do live in kin-related groups are more likely to have highly related non-breeding helpers to raise the offspring, much like some mammalian mani species. Nah, that's such a hard word to say, mammalian. In an avian species, the performed cooperative breeding, it has been observed that the helpers often lighten the load of the breeders by allowing the breeders similar to the female meerkats to decrease their efforts this load lightening behavior of birds may produce significant extra gains to the helpers indirect fitness ensuring the increased lifespan of relatives and ensuring the reproductive success of related breeders fish remember not to Fish, so they like swim. I don't know why I'm doing that, man. But anyway, um, fish. So it's a study con conducted um, on a species of African cichlid, which I'm not even going to try and pronounce because it's got this big horrible scientific name. Um, and it suggests that the cooperative breeding behaviour could come down to four hypotheses: kin selection. Where an individual remains within their natal group to help their parents or highly related individuals raising their offspring while suppressing their own reproduction. Pay to stay. A little like a human paying rent to stay in an accommodation. With fish, the pay to stay hypothesis is where fish will help breeding fish look after their young in return to be able to stay in the breed dominant breeders territory giving them the sneaky chance to maybe reproduce so signals of pes peristide i probably am not saying this right because i butcher everything um it's a hypothesis similar to that discovered in birds where a male fish helps a breeding pair to raise their offspring to show the female what a good mate he will be. This is to try and help breed with her in the next breeding season. Group augmentation possibly where the helpers aid the breeders to raise their offspring allowing the breeders to focus on producing more offspring increasing the group size the bigger the group size the higher the survival rate of each member of the group becomes which basically means they that there's more of them um, to escape predators and then because they've got all these helpers the breeders can just keep on breeding and they don't really need to worry too much about looking after the young so it benefits everybody in conclusion there is no definitive answer as to why subordinates delay reproduction and remain within their natal groups or why some individuals help the dominant pair in their reproductive efforts. It has been discovered that helpers are aiding breeders to raise their offspring for several reasons. It appears that some species have evolved to help breeders and in the process to halt their reproduction when the individual can gain some benefits. Benefits can be indirect to individuals. For example, some an animals may never get the chance to breed, choosing to stay in their natal groups, helping their parents raise their siblings. If their siblings get the chance to breed, at least some of their genetic material will live on it in the siblings' offspring. Some animals choose to live with it in groups and help out with the offspring as there is safety in numbers and better access to resources such as food and territory.
Some males of certain species may only help the breeders to raise their offspring to show the breeding female that he is a good mating material and try to get her to mate with him in the next breeding season. However, a lot more research into the reasoning and the benefits gained by helpers still needs to be investigated to fully explain the evolution, the evolution of cooperative breeding. So... That's all about corruptive breeding and a few examples of animals that do this corruptive breeding um, and a few reasons why this might happen. So if you've learned something and you've enjoyed this content, click on my face down here. You'll be able to subscribe. Don't forget to turn on that notification bell and you'll be notified every time I upload a video which is currently every Wednesday and every Saturday. If you want to see any more animal related content, then click on the playlist down here in Italy and you can discover all the other animal content. And for now, don't forget to, if you've got any questions, drop it in the comment section and I'll try and answer you. Um, and that's all I have. Don't forget to share as well. Share this with all your friends and they can be educated as well. And I'll see you in the next video. Bye.